Let us now discuss theories of stresses and strains. In this presentation, we will discuss deformation of a deformable body. So imagine we have got a body in an undeformed configuration shown in a uh, 3D real Cartesian system. There is a point X in the undeformed configuration of the body, which is shown by a position vector X. Please note, whenever a vector is aiming from the coordinate system to a particular point, we are calling that a position vector. When a vector is aiming from a one point to another point, that is a vector. If you want to know further about the vectors and the position vectors, please look into the mathematical preliminaries. So a point X is at a position vector X from the Cartesian system origin. This point X is displaced once the body is subjected to some set of loading. So in the deformed configuration, the point X moves to point X dash. X dash is shown by a position vector Y. Please note the resultant Y is equal to the sum of the position vector X plus the vector U. It goes without saying that the body is continuous and coherent. In other words, there are no gaps or cracks in the body and the particles inside the body are uniformly distributed. So there are no gaps in between the particles. When the relative position of any two points in a continuous body is changed, the body is said to be deformed or strained. If the distance between every pair of points in the body remains constant during the motion of the body, then the body undergoes rigid body motion. So imagine if on the same body we take two points and those two points, the distance between those two points stay the same after the deformation, then that is called rigid body motion. In our elementary statics and dynamics, we dealt with rigid body motions and rigid bodies. The displacement of a rigid body motion consists of translation and rotations. Translation and rotations are therefore called rigid body displacements. In contrast to the rigid bodies, the analysis of strain is concerned with the study of deformation of continuous body, which is a geometric problem and is unrelated to the properties of body material. So if we have a straight line AB and after deformation it becomes A dash B dash, we can appreciate that this is just a change in the geometry. The body will either be stretched or squished after the deformation. So correspondingly the line will be either stretched or it will be squished. Under this discussion, we can say that the specification of strain at a particular point is therefore the same for elastic or plastically deforming bodies. Now let us discuss normal strain. Imagine we have the same body, which is in undeformed configuration, and we pick one line, which is shown as AB on the body. This line is in the direction of vector n. Under the small deformation, this AB changes. So initially, if the distance between A and B was L0, after deformation, the distance between A dash B dash is L. The reason we have changed the symbol from A to A dash is that this line may have gone somewhere else within the body. So the position can't be a or B. The new position is A dash B dash, but it's the same line, the same point has gone somewhere else within the deformed configuration. So in reality, we are actually decomposing the same body into an undeformed configuration and a deformed configuration. So these are two systems, two separate systems. One is the deformed undeformed configuration and another one is deformed configuration. I have mentioned again and again on the on the sketches that it is a small deformation problem. So if the body is getting deformed, its deformation is almost of the same shape 
as the original undeformed configuration. We don't have such a significantly different configuration from the initial undeformed configuration. In this course, we will mainly constrain ourselves to small deformation. So as we can see, the red boundary is slightly changed after the application of the load. Now, we can say that if the distance L is not equal to L0, then there has been a relative displacement of P with respect to A, and the body has undergone a deformation. If L0 is considered small enough, then this deformation may be considered to be homogeneous along AB. And the relative displacement L minus L0 can be considered to be proportional to L0. The ratio of change in length to the original length is defined as direct or linear strain. Sometimes this is also called as engineer strain. So the strain along the vector n is L minus L0, which is the change in length, by L0, which is the original length. Now there is a concept of a strain at a point. The state of a strain at a point is defined as the totality of all the changes in the length of the lines or fibers of the material which pass through the point. So imagine we have one point and we are trying to study the strain at that point. So this point might be made up of infinite number of other points or other lines. If this point A moves to A dash, that means that this is the sum of all the changes in length of all the lines which are touching this point A. So we can define straight strain at a point as L dash minus L divided by L when B, point B, approaches A. So please notice, we are trying to find out changes, infinitesimal changes within the body by introducing the concept of strain at a point and therefore we can we are trying to pave the way for calculus mathematical preliminaries in, on this channel describe the calculus and how calculus is related to advanced structure mechanics so when we apply this limit we actually say that this is the normal strain at a along the vector n n is a particular unit vector at, at point A. The reason we have vector n introduced in our normal strain definition is that normal strain is dealing with displacements at particular point. And if a body is considered to be made up of infinite lines like AB, then the vector n tells us like which line we are interested in. Let us now determine the rate of change of displacement when we are moving in x1 direction. So we consider a 2D Cartesian setting and if we are moving along x1 direction, what will be the rate of change of displacement? Thus in x1 direction, A moves from x1a to y1a as we can see that we have x and this if this is xa it moves from the undeformed configuration to the deformed con configuration so it goes from x1a to y1a please note that this point is defined by position vector in the undeformed and deformed configuration so A moves from X1A to Y1A, and Y1A would be equal to X1A plus U1A. And that comes from here, as we know that Y is equal to U plus X. Similarly, point B moves from X1B to Y1B, and Y1B is equal to X1B plus U1B. Let's define delta x1 and delta y1. Delta x1 is x1b minus x1a and delta y1 is y1b minus y1a. 
plugging the values of y1b and y1a from these two equations gives us x1b plus u1b minus x1a minus u1a. Now, using these variables, delta x1 and delta y1, we get delta x1 plus delta u1, where delta u1 is u1b minus u1a. So, delta y1 is the final length of the body. Delta x1 is the original length. So, imagine we have this point defined by x. So, if we have two points over here, we would have one x1 vector, x1a, and another one, another point defined by position vector x1b. So, in this figure, point A would be defined by a position vector x1a and point B by position vector x1b. When both the position vectors are subtracted, we would get the original length of AB, which is delta x1. We call it delta x1 because we are dealing with x1 element. So, based on this discussion, we can say that if our point A and B are at a position vector xA and xB, then delta x will be xB minus xA. This is similar to what we have over here. The displacement of x dash from point x is equal to y bar minus x. Similarly, after deformation, our delta y would be equal to yb vector minus y a vector these both vectors are position vectors so we get delta y is equal to delta x1 delta y1 is equal to delta x1 plus delta u1 and that is similar to what we said the change in displacement plus the position vector of the first point would be equal to the position vector of the point in deformed configuration so delta y1 is the final length of the line ab af after deformation so we can write the deformation is equal to delta y1 minus delta x1 delta x1 is the original length delta y1 is the final length so final minus original will give us the deformation and that is equal to delta u1 by the original length which is delta x1 for strain at a point, we take limit when B approaches A and this delta U by delta X changes into rate of change of U1 with respect to X1. This is the partial derivative. The reason it's partial because U is dependent on X1, X2, X3 and in some cases time also. This is also, uh, this is also written as U11. Similarly, we can work out the, the strain in 2-2 two, two and strain in 3-3 three, three directions. There are, however, two types of strain. The direct strain due to change in length, as we discussed over here, and the shear strain, which involves distortion rather than stretch or contraction of any fiber within the material. Instead of drawing a line through A, we draw two lines in case of shear strain, i.e. AB and AC, making an angle theta naught in the original position of the body as shown in this figure. This theta naught can be equal to pi by 2 if AB and AC are orthogonal to each other. With respect to AB, we have got a vector n, and with respect to AC, we have got another vector t. After the body has been subjected to the applied forces, and if theta naught is not equal to theta, then a shear strain is said to have taken place. Theta is the angle between n and t after the deformation. So, shear strain is written as theta minus theta naught. This is also called as average strain. So, if theta is greater than theta naught, then the angle decreases. If theta naught is greater than theta, then the angle increases. Like normal strains, we 
have state of shear strain at a point. State of shear strain at a point can be the totality of all the changes in the angle between any pair of lines radiating from this point. At point A, we have many pair of lines. Currently, we can see a single pair of line, which is AB and AC. But in reality, we can have infinite pairs like these at point A, which are at different inclination. The shear strain at a point is the totality of all the changes in the angle between all these pairs of lines which are radiating from point A. Now let us derive equation for shear in 2D setting. Imagine we have an element as shown in this figure in 2D setting. Imagine we take these two points. So these two lines are the same as these two lines on the body. Imagine we have this line moving by angle gamma 1, 2. If the length of this element is considered as 1, then tangent gamma, gamma would be equal to A by 1. Now let us try to derive shear strain equation. Imagine we have got an element whose sides are of unit length. Imagine one side of this element is moved by distance a. a is in line with the axis x1. So tangent gamma 1, 2 would be equal to a by 1. If gamma is small, we can write tangent gamma as gamma. In this type of deformation, we have u2 equal to 0. So we can write u1 is equal to a times x2. x this means to say that x2 is between 0 and 1, whereas the range of u is from 0 to a. Similarly, if we consider another element which is moving by a distance b in the x2 direction, we can write gamma 1, 2 is approximately equal to b. And u1 in this case is 0. U2 would be equal to b times x1. Thus, x1 ranges from 0 to 1 in this equation, and u2 is from 0 to b. According to our definition of shear strain, we should have a and b occurring at the same time. In other words, the deformation of the concurrent sides should be happening at the same time. Unlike the first case where only one side is moving by gamma 1, 2 and the other case where the other side is moving. So this is actu the actual shear deformation of an element. As we have worked out, u1 is ax2, u2 is bx1. So gamma 1, 2 would be equal to a plus b can also be written as rate of change of u1 with respect to x2 and rate of change of u2 with respect to x1. We can also write this as u1, 2 plus u2, 1. Similarly, we can find out gamma 1, 3 as u1, 3 and u3, 1. Gamma 2, 3 as gamma u2, 3 plus u3, 2. All these displacement rates which we have worked out can be written in the form of a tensor which is shown over here. So we have u11, u12, u13, u221, u22, u23, u31, u32, u33. This tensor is also called displacement gradient. It is shown by h tilde. Tilde means that it is a second order tensor. A second order tensor can have nine components. In order to understand what a second order tensor is and what is a gradient of a vector space, we should go through the mathematical preliminaries. The component of this tensor can be written as curly ui by curly xj, where i is the row and J is the column.